Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the City of Dublin business webinar on Learn About Web Accessibility and How to Use It to Increase Your Revenue. My name is Felicia Escover, and I'm with the City of Dublin's Economic Development Team. Um, today, we are here to explore the crucial topic of web accessibility and its impact on your business. Um, we're thrilled to have Richard Wilkinson from Trezetto Digital joining us as our presenter. Um, as we all know, having an accessible website is not just about legal requirements, it's really about creating an inclusive digital space that benefits um, your customers and, and your bottom line. So throughout this webinar, Richard, um, the expert on this topic, is going to guide us on understanding web accessibility, its implications, and how we can leverage it to, to drive additional revenue growth. Um, we encourage you to drop questions into the Q&A or jot them down and have them ready for our Q&A session at the end of this presentation. And so now let's introduce our presenter. Um, so I'm joined with Richard Wilkinson. He is the founder and CEO of Trezetto Digital, a Northern California digital marketing agency based out of Livermore. As an entrepreneur for over 25 years, Richard has a unique uh, perspective on all things sales, marketing, and small business. Um, as a California native, um, Richard grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area and currently resides in Livermore with his wife, three cats, and one dog. Um, he has two daughters, both pursuing careers outside of the Bay Area, with one in Denver, Colorado, and the other one in Fullerton, California. In his spare time, he enjoys bike riding and wine tasting, often at the same time. Um, and Richard is also one of the consultants in our Small Business Navigator program, supporting local businesses with their marketing and website needs. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Richard to kind of take us through the presentation. Okay, Richard, and you're on. We see your slide, so whenever you're ready, feel free to get started. Thank you, Felicia. I appreciate the great introduction. And I also want to thank the um, City of Dublin Economic Development Department for hosting this important webinar. And I do want to thank everyone for joining today. Um, so enough about me. I, I just wanted to show you uh, my dog Milo, he's right there learning uh, learning how to code. So uh, we do have a full team here, and um, the agenda today is pretty packed. Um, I promise to um, keep it hopefully engaging. Uh, there's a lot to take in, uh, but at a high level, you know what we're going to learn today is you know what does ADA compliance mean relative to your website? Why your website should comply with ADA regulations? And finally, how to make your website accessible for all. And I do encourage you all to stay through the entire webinar. We will be offering a free, no obligation evaluation of your company website. So we will provide the link at the end of the session. I must, um, I do have to say that there is a bit of a disclaimer here. Um, some of the subject matter today is legal and uh, I do, do need to say that uh, Trezetto Digital is not an attorney. We cannot give legal advice. Uh, the, the information we're providing today is current as of today to our knowledge, but we do recommend that any of you interested in this topic should seek legal counsel to understand how the laws might affect your particular business. So enough of that. So for us to understand what ADA compliance means relative to your website, we really have to go back over 30 years ago, and understand that the ADA, which is the Americans with Disabilities Act, was first established in 1990. And the entire point of that law was both a civil rights law to help against discrimination of Americans with disabilities, plus it imposed physical accessibility requirements in the workplace and for accommodations in public transit buildings. And really the core principle of ADA is equal access for all. And throughout this conversation, you know, that topic is going to continue to come up again and again. 
Um, and, and so some of you on this webinar uh, may actually be young enough where you didn't live life uh, seeing scenes like this. Um, the fact that uh, all of us today would probably be extremely outraged if we did um, see something like this. Um, but thankfully, uh, this was before ADA. And the benefit of having these types of laws is that over time, you know, it was established in 1990, it did take some time. But over time, the physical uh, environment became more like what we're accustomed to today. And we might actually take some of these things for granted that um, there could be a wheelchair lift uh, in a staircase environment where there's no elevator. Uh, we're all familiar with these accessible restrooms that are larger for wheelchairs. And of course, the famous push to open button that uh, all of us abled people even like to use. And, and so all of these things came about because of this law that was passed. And what happened, the timing of the law was interesting. So passed in 1990, websites didn't start to become popular until 1991. And when they first started, websites were more technical. They were not necessarily used by the general public. Uh, there was no Amazon, there was no DoorDash. So uh, the very beginnings of the internet were quite different than what they are today. Uh, but So because of that, the ADA does not specifically mention websites, um, but just like ramps and wider hallways make buildings accessible for someone in a wheelchair, we also need to consider that for digital assets and websites. So therefore, the terminology today is either digital accessibility, web accessibility, or what we like to call is fully website accessibility. And so that's what we're going to talk about today and how that, um, how that impacts what you might be doing with your small business. And we'll, we'll discuss a number of different um, disabilities, but um, this picture here, uh, I just want to point out that there's a device this gentleman is holding in his mouth, and there's a joystick here that he's using. So we'll talk about all these types of things, um, but you know what, what types of disabilities are we talking about? Because those of us that are able, we may not understand why it's difficult for people to access a website if it doesn't have special consideration. And so there's a wide range of different disabilities that can be, uh, your website can impact uh, all the way from something that, that what we call situational, um, you know, something with vision where perhaps um, you've got poor eyesight, sun glare could even be an issue on a screen. We've all tried to do that with our mobile devices, moving out of the sunlight to see it. Um, hearing, physical mobility, speech, cognitive, and neural. And, and so we go across this entire spectrum from situational to temporary uh, to permanent. And, and that's really what we're talking about today is how this impacts people. And just like uh, with the ADA, before ADA, you saw the wheelchair couldn't get up the stairs. Well, I want you to imagine in your mind what it might be like for somebody with a disability to use your website today. And you know, here's a gentleman, he, your website is obviously not closed, but to him, it's closed. And so the, the whole point of website accessibility is to change that perspective change your perspective and get you to open your website so that again, the, the, the core tenant here is equal access for all. There's absolutely no difference when we talk about physical accessibility and compare it to website accessibility. It really means the same thing. The steps to get there are, are slightly different because obviously a website is more technical and I would say that whenever we talk about this topic, 99% of people don't have a clue that they're doing something wrong. It doesn't make you a bad person. It just means that we need to have more awareness, which is why we're doing these types of webinars, to increase your awareness and help you understand that you need to change things on your website to make it accessible for all. Let's start talking about what, what specifically that looks like. 
And what that looks like is people utilizing different technology than you might see in your everyday life. Here's a person that's blind and, and she's using a braille keyboard. So it's a special keyboard. There are many, many types of um, assistive technologies, screen readers, screen magnification software, um, sip and puff, which was the device that gentleman had in the earlier picture. Um, so, so there's all these types of assistive technologies that can be used. And what I never realized, uh, if, if you remember when I was uh, introduced, uh, I wear eyeglasses. Now, I never thought of myself as disabled, but the fact is that uh, I am nearsighted, which means I cannot see far. If I take off my eyeglasses, in a sense, I am disabled because I cannot see uh, what's coming at me, which could certainly be dangerous if I'm driving or something. Um, so I now recognize that I use an assistive technology. It's my eyeglasses. And it's extremely helpful and I could not go through my day without those. And so people with disabilities have that same experience. Uh, they use assist assistive devices um, all, all day long, and it's natural to them. So what I'd like to do is share a video of somebody using a screen reader, because I think the best way for you to understand some of these limitations and how difficult it is, is to, to actually witness somebody. I'm going to play this video from Mark Sutton. He's with the University of California in San Francisco, and he did this demonstration. So let me go ahead and play that here. This is Mark Sutton from the University of California, San Francisco's IT Web Services Department. Here today with a brief tour of screen reading technology. I'm a blind person who has been using screen readers, braille writers, scanning equipment, other adaptive technologies since my childhood. What a screen reader does is, for example, I'm going to read this, start to read this page. And what I will now do is slow down the speech rate. 75%, 70%, 65%, 50%, 50%, 40%, 40%, 50%, 40%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50
until 1998 when President Clinton signed into law the Rehabilitation Act amendments, which created something that called Section 508. And what that said is any electronic access and information provided by the federal government had to be web, web accessible. And so anytime you visit a federal government website, it will be under Section 508, and it'll be very easy to use with screen readers or any assistive technology. And that's been the case since the early 2000s. Uh, in fact, the City of Dublin website would also fall under those parameters because it, it impacts anybody that receives federal funding, which would also explain why the University of California, San Francisco's website was so easy to use, because again, that would fall under Section 508. So for all of us that have been doing website design since the late 90s, there really wasn't much guidance. There, there wasn't much that made us, required us to do anything um, until 1999. And what happened in 1999 is um, the uh, World Wide Web Consortium uh, came out with something they called the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines or WCAG. So I'm going to I'm going to say that word, uh, that funny word. Um, so WCAG was really the first step in establishing any kind of guidelines uh, for website developers to understand how to make websites accessible. And so um, after that, in 99, they published uh, version two in 2008. They iterated it, iterated on it um, in 2018, and they are currently planning a release in uh, October of this year. Uh, to strengthen it further. And so you might be asking yourself, well, what does this mean for you? Well, um, for you, it gives your, or the professionals you might be working with, it gives guidance. So it's really four core principles around perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. And uh, within those categories, we can place different criteria as a web developer, we can say, well, if, if something needs to be perceivable uh, and, and WCAG has a standard for it, then we can program to it and we can test to it. And so then what they did is to further um, enhance this, they created these different levels of conformance. And what I want you to think about for a minute is, let's go back to the concept of a building and a wheelchair, and, and how do we make this physical building accessible to everybody in a wheelchair? You can probably imagine it's quite expensive. And um, in fact, uh, my office building in Livermore is a two-story building. It is an older building, and it's been what's called grandfathered. So uh, there is no elevator in our building. Uh, luckily, I have a ground floor unit, but um, uh, you know, other businesses that are upstairs, you know, would have difficulty accepting people in a wheelchair. But the federal government recognized that it would be quite expensive to force everybody to do this. And so the building owner does not have to comply with ADA unless he does a significant amount of renovations, and then he'd be forced to put in an elevator. And so the same concept held true for websites. If, if we're gonna make websites accessible, we can't make them so expensive that people can't afford to do them. And so within the standards, there's three levels. So A is the lowest, double A is mid, mid range, and triple A is the most difficult to achieve. Uh, most of our work that we do today is in the double A range, just because it's both affordable and it handles the bulk of the issues. And so what are those types of things and how many of them are there? Well, again, I refer to them as success criteria, which is what they are. And within each uh, release, there were a certain number of criteria that had to be met. And, and then each successive release had to be met to meet the, the, if you met 2.1, you had to also meet 2.0. So it was inclusive. So if I'm going to be uh, considered WCAG 2.1 level A, um, if, I've, if I've passed those criteria, I would have to do 30 different things as a web developer in terms of making sure certain things are programmed correctly and testing them. 
And so you can see how this kind of adds up. And, and if I'm going to go to the, the highest level, triple A, um, it's going to add another 28. So then in, in total, if I went for that, there would be 78 success criteria, which again, you can all relate that back to cost. The, the more that we have to do as web developers, the more it's going to cost. Um, and in fact, this latest uh, revision when it comes out is going to add another additional nine success criteria. And so it would be helpful for you guys to just see maybe, you know, what, what some of these criteria are so that you have a better understanding of them. And again, with 78 of them, it's difficult, uh, especially in a webinar environment, it's difficult for me to show you those on a live website just because we don't want technology glitches to get in the way. So um, we, we've just kind of taken some of the most common ones and we wanna show you, you know, exactly you know, what category they fall under and uh, why they fall under that category. And, and maybe they'll become obvious to you when you look at your website. So the first one is something that's um, color contrast and it, it falls within the perceivable category. And if you look at these um, blocks over here, you'll notice that it says high contrast, which is good because it's a black background with white font. And then if we reverse that with a white background with black font, it's still good. But what happens when we go to like a teal background with you know maybe just a slightly darker teal font? You can see right away that that's a poor contrast. And if, if I was somebody that had some kind of disability um, related to contrast, uh, I may not be able to actually read this. It, it may just look like a block of teal text, or I'm sorry, just a block of teal without any text. And so this is probably the easiest one to figure out. This is the one we run across on, on almost every website. And the reason is uh, most people, including us, um, you, know, you can see our logo down here, uh, we want to use our brand colors, which from a marketing perspective, that's exactly what you should do, is try to use your brand colors and everything. But sometimes your brand colors don't work on um, the type of background or the type of color. So you, you have to shift maybe the particular color to make sure that you fall within these guidelines. Another one that's pretty easy to understand is, and again, it falls under the perceivable one, is any type of image. So here's a cute dog. This is not my dog, but I, I love dogs. So I thought this would be a good, good picture to reference. Um, when we look at this um, as, as sighted people on a website, we can kind of infer what's happening. We can see the dog licking his nose, maybe, maybe his, um, his owner just gave him some peanut butter or something, you know, that he's, he's he enjoyed and he continues to lick. Um, but a, a non-sighted person has no idea what this image is. And if we're going to talk about marketing, it's also helpful to understand that Google does not understand what this image is. And so for any of you that are trying to get ranked in Google, it's also helpful to uh, look at this this criteria, which is called our alternative text. What we do as developers is there's code behind this picture and we can describe what this image is. We can, we can put in specifically a dog licking himself um, after eating peanut butter. Um, and so what would happen is, you know, Mark with the screen reader, he would get to this image and his screen reader would read that to him so that he can visualize what this what this web page is all about with this dog and his tongue sticking out, as well as Google. Um, you can put keywords, you can put descriptions of your products that maybe you sell peanut butter for dogs. And so you have this picture and you know that would be the description you put for Google to pick up on. Um, so the more we start talking about this, you're going to see that doing some of these things uh, for people with disabilities will actually help market your website. Another one that you might have noticed, um, when I was playing the video with Mark, I had turned on closed captions. And so, um, you know, here's a video with no captions. Here's the video with closed captioning. Um, again, I don't know uh, the ages of everyone on this webinar today, but 
Uh, my kids are in their 20s and they uh, absolutely love using captioning on everything. And, and so we fight constantly uh, on our Netflix account. Every time I go to watch something, um, I particularly don't like reading. I just like watching. <laughs> and for some reason, they both like um, you know, reading the captions. So I don't know if it's a generational thing, but um, at any rate, um, anybody that um, you know ha has issues with hearing or um, you know closed captioning is is another perceivable um, issue. And um, what I'm going to encourage, uh, you know, I, I don't know if the city does this, but uh, bec because um, you know, this will be a recorded webinar. I'm going to encourage the city to make sure we have closed captioning on, uh, but it does require extra work. So again, everything I'm talking about, um, it, it's great, but it does require extra work. So the next one is what we would call operable. And you saw some of it when Mark was demoing the screen reader. He was using the tab key on his uh, keyboard. And so what this is, is a GIF of um, just that. And, and when you see these blue boxes, that's somebody tabbing. And the important part here is there's a skip button at the top. If, if a website's programmed correctly, it will have a skip button. And, and the, all of us can just mouse on down and scroll on down below the navigation. But somebody using a screen reader with a keyboard the only function they have is the tab key. And so you can imagine how aggravating it would be to have to sit there and tab through an entire menu just to get to the main content. So that's the whole point of this success criteria is do I have a skip to content button? Another great one falls under the understandable criteria. Now this one, almost every, form I find on the web tends to um, break this criteria. And it, it, it's the fact that nobody thinks through what's happening here. So on this side here, we, we have a series of, of colors. And it's really obvious maybe to, to me as a sighted person um, that green might mean it's good and red might mean it's bad. But one of the criteria is that we cannot use color alone to, to identify things. And, and so when we look at this um, more obvious side, which is somebody would have done some extra coding to make it more obvious, you know, having the green check mark and the red X is a bit more obvious to people because again, um, if, if you were not able to see green, if you were colorblind, you would still see a check. And if you couldn't see red, you could still see the X. So you might know that there's something wrong, as well as having this additional text that describes what the problem is. Because again, if we go back to Mark and him trying to use a screen reader with a tab key, how does he get into these fields to, to start typing what he wants? And once he hits submit, how does he know what's wrong with it? So again, you really have to look at this from a completely different angle to understand what might be wrong with the website. And the final standard is robust. Now, being robust means that your website will be able to handle all the different accessibility tools that somebody needs to use. And it's hard for me to demo that. I think the best demo I could give you was the video of Mark using the screen reader because part of the cost that goes into creating a website that's accessible is the fact that we have to have humans do testing. Um, we'll talk about some shortcuts that people try to take when they do website accessibility. There is unfortunately no shortcuts. The best way to make a website accessible is through proper coding of the WCAG standards and human testing. And so again, we've kind of gone through all the standards. So hopefully that makes it a little less technical for you and hopefully you can understand that. So let's get down to tax here. What, what is it that you want to know in terms of why should your website comply with ADA regulations? And we've covered some of it through the conversation here. 
But the very first point I should make to you is that, well, it's really the right thing to do. Um, it, it, in today's environment, everyone's talking about inclusion. Well, it's wrong for you to not make your website accessible because otherwise you're excluding people. So first and foremost, it is the right thing to do. Uh, secondarily, it does create a better user experience, uh, which can get you ranked higher in Google. So from a marketing perspective, um, you know, the, the, the whole lead into this webinar was how to make more revenue. And so, you know, we're starting to get into the point here. Uh, the point of, of all this is, you know, if, if you make it more inclusive, number one, you're, you're going to open up your audience. And number two, you're going to get ranked higher in Google. So those are all things that can help you make revenue. And the final point, which I never lead in with, but um, it can be a legal requirement depending on your state. And unfortunately, there have been a series of lawsuits that have started to occur. So we will talk about that. Um, so look, let's look at your customer base and, and getting market share over competitors. Uh, you may not be aware that one in four adults in the US lives with a disability. And so that is 26% of the population. If you're a US-based business, that's 85 million people uh, that are living with a disability. And if you go back to the early picture with your website being closed, is that really something you wanna say to 85 million people that your website is closed to them? If you happen to be a business that is uh, international, uh, it's 15% of the world's population, which is 1 billion people. So the point here is that if you're looking to gain market share over your competitors, it, the very first thing you can do is make your website accessible. So why does it benefit everybody? I mean, we talked about the gamut, the entire range of all the disabilities, um, but there's a lot of people that have temporary disabilities. Uh, this is somebody that you know had some eye work done and for a number of days they, they could not and go out in bright sunlight. That's why they're wearing sunglasses. Uh, they also had trouble reading small font. And, and so any anytime you uh, make a website that's accessible for people with vision problems, it does help everybody that might have a temporary problem. And the final point on this is that it may be a legal requirement. So we talked earlier about Section 508. So if you're on here today and you own or work in a commercial business, Section 508 does not apply to you unless for some reason you're getting federal funding. In California, however, there is the Unruh Civil Rights Act, which amazingly was established in 1959, and it protects consumers from discrimination by all business establishments in California. Now, obviously, uh, there was no internet in 1959, but what courts have already been ruling on is that the Unruh Act in California can be applied to a website that is not accessible. So that's um, you know, something to be aware of. There is a growing movement um, by both the Department of Justice and the federal government to kind of go back through and fix the missteps of the ADA law. So the, the, the Department of Justice in, in spring of last year um, started talking about how an inaccessible website can exclude people as much as steps to an entrance to a physical location. And so with that said, um, you're now starting to see pressure uh, because there's been so many lawsuits. And also we've got some federal legislation that was uh, presented last September. It's called the Websites and Software Applications Accessibility Act. And it would require that entities that are covered by the ADA uh, maintain their websites and software acts applications so that they're accessible for Americans with disabilities. Now, unfortunately, um, although these are both um, guidances, they don't have teeth because this bill was not passed in that particular legislative session. But the point being that uh, once you start to see these types of things crop up, it's not going to be long before they become law. And at that point, you're going to be behind the eight ball. So 
the sooner you can do something to get your website accessible, uh, the more ahead of the curve you'll be. And again, the final reason, which you know we never like to lead in with, but it's a fact that um, since 2018, the number of lawsuits um, have, have increased exponentially. Um, it is unfortunately what's called predatory uh, lawsuits. And what that means is there's a disabled person, um, let's say in Florida, who is not necessarily using any of these websites, but they find a law firm and there's the top 10 law firms uh, are engaged in 80% of these cases. So this disabled person works with this law firm and they say, well, I can't use this website in California uh, to order anything, so let's sue them. And again, it's, um, it's unfortunate that it's happening. Um, it is happening locally. It is not something that is, um, you know, remotely. It is happening here in the Bay Area. Uh, last April, there were 50 wineries in Napa that were sued, and it, it, it was an individual in Florida that, that brought the lawsuit. And the ironic part, um, the San Francisco Chronicle did this, did this article. Um, this gentleman in the wheelchair in the vineyards, he's not the gentleman that, that, that brought on the lawsuit. He was actually sued. He, he, his family winery in Napa was sued by this gentleman in Florida. So it, it's ironic that uh, a disabled person is suing another disabled business owner. Um, they were the lawsuit was asking for twenty eight thousand uh, dollars. The winery settled for eight thousand. I want you to remember those numbers because uh, we do have a slide about how much all this costs, uh, and it's significantly less than both of those numbers. <laughs> okay, so we've gone through quite a bit. Hopefully, you're still with me. Let's talk about the steps that you can take to make your website accessible for all. The very first thing you need to do is evaluate your current website to understand how well or poorly it complies with ADA and WCAG. Now, maybe you got lucky, maybe you worked with a great developer and your website is accessible, but you know the only way to tell is through some testing. The other thing you need to do is hire a qualified web developer that knows WCAG. Your website may be beautiful, but graphic artists do not understand technical coding. And so you need to work with someone that understands technical coding. And the final thing is to post an accessibility statement, which I'll, I'll show you uh, at the end of this. And it, it'll explain a little bit more about why, why that's helpful. Um, so the first thing is when you audit your website, Testing tools can evaluate a lot of different things. And as I mentioned earlier, um, a lot of the accessibility uh, criteria can only be evaluated by a human being, but some of these tools have, have become quite efficient at at least picking out a lot of the common issues. And so if we look at this pie chart, you know, this particular website that we evaluated um, a, a lot of the things are things we talked about. Ensure text has sufficient contrast. Specify alternate text for images. Ensure form controls contrast sufficiently with their backgrounds. Um, so really, it, almost 50% of this website's problems are some of those things that, that we showed you earlier. And they're fairly easy to fix. Now, again, these tools look at the spectrum of different types of issues. And so um, some of them might, may not be as easy to fix, but you get the point is the first step should be understanding where you are. The second step, working with a qualified professional, um, if you prioritize the low hanging fruit, in other words, color contrast is something, if, if you took care of color contrast right away, you might find that your website is far more accessible uh, than if you get delve into some of the more difficult things. So work with your qualified professional to prioritize. The thing I wanna caution you on is what we call the quick fix. Um, I don't know if anybody is familiar with these. Um, they're called web, web accessibility overlays. If you go on a website, and you look down typically in the bottom right, sometimes it's in the bottom left, 
there's a floating little round icon of a person who I suppose you're supposed to understand that this means that, that click on this if you're disabled. So that's kind of problem number one. Um, if I can't see it, how do I click on it? Um, problem number two is, well, if I'm disabled, why should I have to do something extra? If we go back and think about ADA, you know, equal access for all, I shouldn't have to, aside from using, um, you know, specialized technology like a screen reader, I as an individual shouldn't have to do anything different than anybody else to use your website to make it equal access for all. So these overlays are extremely bad. Um, most web developers are selling them because they don't want to take the time to do the right thing, which is do the hard programming. Uh, they can cost you anywhere from $39 to $200 a month. And what happens once you stop paying, whatever they're fixing goes away. And in fact, they don't fix much. Um, 700 industry experts have signed a petition to eliminate these companies, but unfortunately they are going as strong as ever. Um, and what I wanna do again is show you uh, an actual user uh, because when when you see when you see somebody that is disabled and and hear them, I think it's impactful. So Habin Gurma is the first deafblind person to graduate from Harvard Law School, and she now is a human rights lawyer advancing disability justice. And I wanted you to hear her because she's someone that's very well respected. President Obama named her White House Champion of Change. She's received the Heller Kellen Achievement Award, a spot on Forbes 30 Under 30, and the Time 100 Talks. So let's take a listen to what uh, Haben has to say about these overlays. It's a myth out there that you can rely on AI for all your accessibility needs. AI is great in certain very specific situations, but these companies out there, there are many of them, so it's not just one. They're claiming you can add one line of code and then your website will be accessible given their AI-based accessibility solutions. It's extremely frustrating to me and many of my blind friends that millions of dollars are being poured into these companies. One of these companies is called Accessibi, and I went to their website. I'm blind, I'm a screen reader user, so I navigate websites using a screen reader. And on their own website, I encountered barriers. If I'm finding barriers on their own website, how can I trust them? to make other websites accessible. I don't, I don't trust them to make other websites accessible. And I'm not the only one. Over 400 accessibility experts and allies have signed a document describing the harms these services cause. Beware of companies claiming to use AI-based solutions to make websites accessible. Avoid these companies. Take full responsibility for accessibility. Disabled people are 1 billion people around the world. That's a huge market. When you invest in accessibility, you get more customers, more revenue in the long run, and your product is better overall. Invest in real accessibility solutions. If you enjoyed the video, Okay, so um, hopefully that had an impact on you. Um, it uh, kind of goes along the lines of what we were talking about, uh, you know, for this particular webinar, in terms of uh, in increasing your revenue. And so Haben, you know, made some good points there about investing in um, investing in accessibility to help you with your revenue. Um, so let me go. We're almost done here. Uh, one more uh, video. Drop a. Sorry, I got uh, locked in here. Um... Comment, like the video.
That way, subscribe. Sorry about that. The video looks like it locked me out of my uh, my session here. So let me uh, let me pause that for a minute and get back into it. Okay, so let me. Oh. All right, I'm just going to reshare my uh, my screen here. Bear with me, I'm almost there. And Felicia, we're almost done, so I don't know if you have any Q and A's, but uh, we'll get to that in a minute here. Okay, hopefully my video is back there. Apologize, everybody. So, um, you know, the final thing we should talk about is well, what does it cost if you're not going to take the shortcut? Uh, what does it actually cost? And so there's two ways of going about this. There's what's called remediation. So if we look at your website and we come up with all these issues from the testing tools, uh, we can go into your existing website and, um, you know, make the changes to fix it. And it's typically $1,000 to $2,000. It does depend on how complex your site is and what it was programmed in. Uh, and this is for a typical 10-page marketing website. Um, you can also look at just starting from scratch. I mean, a, building a new website um, typically ranges from $2,000 to $3,000. And so, you know, depending on how old your website is, it might actually be beneficial um, in, instead of, um, you know, remediation is just building a new website. Um, so that is it. Thank you for sticking around so long. Uh, what we want to do with the City of Dublin's help, we've created a, a special page for you. Um, we're offering this free no obligation. And the reason it's no obligation, we're happy to do the test, evaluate it. We're happy to talk to you about it. You're under no obligation to use our services. This message today was really public awareness. If you have a web developer you'd like to work with, um, having this scan will help you start the conversation with them and help you make your website accessible to all. So thank you very much, everybody. And thank you, Richard. That was very thorough. And I feel like I learned a lot. And I'm sure the, the folks um, attending um, also picked up some great tidbits. So um, if, if folks have questions, feel free to, to drop them into the Q&A and chat, and um, we'll go ahead and kind of answer some of those um, questions as time allows. Um, to get us started, you talked about businesses can do the, the scan to get a sense of um, where they're currently at. Um, is there, are there other things that businesses could do, say, today to take a step towards being more accessible in their in their websites. Well, I think just um, you know be, being aware that there's a, an issue is is the first thing. So um, without the scan, the, the thing they can do would be to look at um, just visually look at their website, and maybe they can pick up on some of the things. Um, you can um, start your website, hit the tab key. The very first thing you do, just hit the tab key. Um, if you don't see the skip navigation, well, then you already know that your website doesn't have those types of things. Um, so there's some awareness things that people can do um, to help understand where they're at without um, some of these testing tools. Um, so yeah, I would just say the best thing to do is just have an awareness of it um, and, and budgeting. I mean, uh, if, if you haven't frankly, if you haven't redesigned your website in five years, it's time anyway from a from just a pure marketing perspective. And again, as I said, if you're going to do that, you might as well budget for a little bit extra to have um, someone do the, the all the proper coding for web accessibility. Great. Thank you. Yeah. And I and I think after this webinar, I'll definitely kind of be more mindful as I'm checking out different websites to see like, are the features there, right? Because it's something that um, is not top of mind for everyone. But once you kind of see it and the great examples you pointed out, um, I think it's, yeah, much easier to, to spot. Um, let's see. Um, 
Okay, we have a question come in. So what's the best way to find reputable companies in this field? We heard in, in the video that there's some that claim to be kind of experts and be able to help you, but um, how do you go about kind of vetting these different services and companies? Well, the first thing I would say to them is, you know, you just have to ask the question, do you, do you when, when you program a website for us, um, is it going to meet the, the WCAG standards? Or you could even, you know, the, the terminology gets, um, you know, we use ADA kind of hand in hand. So if somebody called me and said, do you do ADA compliant websites? You know, my answer would be yes. And so I think some of the things you learn today are, are the questions I would ask people. Um, you know, there's certainly in our industry, um, there are a lot of qualified people. So I don't want to, I'm not bashing the industry. There's a lot of great developers um, but what we see from a marketing perspective is often um, a great designer who can make a beautiful website may not understand some of the things necessary, um, both from a search engine perspective as well as from an accessibility perspective. So um, you may have to, to, to utilize one agency to do development and another agency to do your marketing. Um, but that would be the first question I would ask now. If they tell you, <clears throat> if they say, oh, we're very reasonable, we have these overlays, they'll solve all your problems. I want you to run. <laughs> those, are, those are not the type of people you want to work with. So if anyone's pitching overlays, those are not people that understand what they're doing. Thank you for those tips. Um, oh, one kind of final question for you. So you work with a lot of um businesses, some some local. Um, do you mind sharing some of the success stories that you've seen or just some case studies of folks that have had some benefits and real results from um, kind of being compliant with these different standards? Yeah, I mean, we've had a number of different um, feedback from clients in terms of, you know, when we've redesigned their website, um, and in particular, you know, one client that does legal work um, you know, he was surprised. He didn't feel like his website was bringing him any business. And, you know, as soon as we redesigned it, he started getting calls. And, you know, that's not necessarily speaking to, you know, the, just some of the marketing work we've done. Um, we also made his website more accessible. And so I think what he was finding was that he was getting um, a, 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 a somebody in the legal field. Um, sometimes people were having problems filling out his forms. And so what he was finding is more and more people are filling out his forms because, again, ironically enough, even a sighted person uh, can benefit from, from some of these techniques to make the forms just, just make more sense. And so those are some of the things that we've found um, from, from just a general public. Uh, we also work with a, a number of um, city agencies that um, do require um, Section 508, and, and so those are always the types of things where, um, you know, you'll, you'll see, um, we, we recently did the um, Amador Valley Industries, which is the garbage company for Dublin, and although they're a commercial business, because they work with the city, we made sure that their website was also accessible, and, and so those are kind of the success stories that the more, the more we do, every website we build, it just gets us closer to equal access for all. Great. Thank you. And I said that was the final question, but I'm going to ask one more to kind of wrap things up here. Um, and so you covered a lot today. What do you hope are kind of the one or two kind of top takeaways from today's session? I think number one is just awareness. I mean, again, we, we recognize that um, it can cost money to do this. And, you know, sometimes it's not a priority. So all I, all I would suggest is, is if you take the, the entire spectrum of what we've talked about um, from understanding what how difficult it is for, for a person to use a website um, all the way to the legal requirements you know, and through the, the, the search benefits, just the awareness is, is important. And, and even if you're not planning to do a redesign or cannot financially afford to do anything now, uh, my hope is that in the future, you know, you'll take this with you and you'll understand that it's important and, and you'll make, uh, you know, use of it the next time you, you do your website. 
great. Thank you so much for that. And yeah, I think awareness is is key and something I'll definitely be taking away from this, not just in terms of website, but just in marketing material in general and in the emails and kind of all the things that are adjacent. So um, I want to just wrap things up by um, thanking everyone for being part of today's business webinar. Uh, we hope you found this session informative and valuable for your business. Uh, I also want to um, just thank Richard for his time and his knowledge um, of this topic area. Um, again, he's with Trezetto Digital, um, and they're a partner with the city um, through the Small Business Navigator program. Um, and so if you're interested in his assistance um, with ADA or your website or marketing needs, then feel free to reach out to me and uh, we can go ahead and, and see if you are eligible for the Small Business Navigator program, which provides technical assistance at no cost to local businesses. So as we finish wrapping up, I encourage you to kind of take the knowledge knowledge and strategies you've learned today and implement them in your digital practices. Um, and if you have any feedback for, for us or suggestions for future webinars or topics uh, that you'd like to see covered, then also feel free to reach out. Um, so thank you again for joining us. Um, goodbye and have a wonderful day.